But Havlicek steals it. Havlicek stole the ball. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. He bullies them and badgers them, lashes them verbally, sometimes plays them with the delicacy of a concert pianist. His fist is iron and his tongue barbed wire. But even as he's riding them, the despot demanding perfection, the players come to realize that Bill Parcells is extracting from them more than they think they have to give. <laughs> Nobody that I've ever covered that pushes the motivational buttons better than he does. He can motivate anybody to do anything. I mean, I've been in restaurants with him where he will motivate the waiter about how he can do his job better. He has an extraordinary ability to get inside a player's head for knowing what makes a player tick. He said, guys who know who they are usually turn out to be the best players in the NFL. Know what you can do and what you can't do. And you know what your problem is? You don't know who you are. I was hurt, but it really motivated me. Sad to say that at first I really didn't understand it, but as I've grown as a player, I really can understand why he did some of the things that he did. He helps players find things inside themselves that they didn't know were in there. He helps players be better than even they thought they could be. As a head coach in the NFL, Parcells turned around four franchises, the Giants, the Patriots, the Jets, and the Cowboys. Part of his technique involved unique methods of motivation. Before a playoff game against the Rams, he went to a very elaborate ruse of putting two airplane tickets on Lawrence Taylor's stool. And Parcells says to him, I want you to go down to New Orleans, and I want you to give that return ticket to Pat Swilling, linebacker with the Saints. You send him up here with your helmet, and, and you stay down there, and you play for the Saints this week, and we'll let him play against Panky. He can play Irv Panky. You can't touch Irv Panky. He dominates you. So I don't want you to play in this game. And Taylor that week went out, and I was at the game. He ate Panky alive. He'll make some type of comment about another player in order to make me play if it's Pat Swillen, if it's Hugh Green, or if it's the Washington Redskins, or you can't catch Randall Cunningham no more. I had an empty gas can that says, do you have any gas left in that tank? And it's like BP Bill Parcells. To me, that's something that not a lot of coaches would do. He found a way to put some humor in the situation and try to get a point across. Okay, I need you for the stretch. I felt obligated as much as anything to make these guys play to their potential as players. And I always felt like that if I didn't do that, that they would eventually resent me. But airline tickets and gas cans were rare highlights to a relentless regiment in which Parcells pushed his players physically and psychologically. He would literally be about two feet behind me. Come on, Sims, get the play out. Come on, get him and go. Let's go. Jesus, are you going to complete a pass today? He would pick like two or three guys, and you know you were in the barrel that day, and he would ride you. You also have to have thick skin because if you do something bad, you know, you're going to hear about it. If you do something good, you're going to hear about the bad stuff that you already did. You know, they say pressure busts pipes. You know, he wants to see if you're going to be that pipe that busts. I've seen him cut a guy. For no reason at all, as far as everybody else seeing it happen, but sometimes you gotta shake it up and do that. Just send a message to everybody else. When you can handle Bill Parcells pressure, or you can handle fourth quarter pressure when it's less than two minutes ago in the game and you need a touchdown. Most of his players that have had any success in the system have hated him. I'm not saying strongly dislike, hated him. When I played for him, I totally hated him. I mean, I'm gonna be honest. I wanted to kill Bill. The seeds of Parcell's confrontational coaching style were sown in his childhood. His dad 
had the same unique way of, of needling people and getting under their skin. My mother was Italian. She had a little volatility. And she was quick to attack your body parts if you were in line. I never feared confrontation. I kind of had grown up with confrontation, and I think confrontation has served me well. When we were playing really, really well as a team, he was miserable because he needs friction. He lives on that friction. He needs adversity, and he's got to have a spat going with the player, and if there's no adversity there, by God, he'll create it. When we won and won well, he was, you know, about as ugly as you could get. He can be an ass. I mean, he could be as tough as they come. If you get embarrassed, if you can't take a ribbon, if you can't take a little bit of punishment, don't walk into a room with Bill Parcells because he'll eat you alive. I remember leaving his office after he confronted me about the way I was playing one time, and I just felt sick to my stomach. I wanted to leave that place and go home and just never see that man again. But for all the complaints about Parcells, he knew how to win. Once he got his first Super Bowl and then got his second Super Bowl, forget it. Everybody won on board. We used to call him Chief Two Rings because, you know, those two rings make such a difference. They validate what he is and how he does it. After eight seasons and two Super Bowl victories as head coach of the New York Giants, Parcells stood astride the NFL. His success made him the league's Pied Piper. In the era of free agency, 11 players followed him from the Giants to the Patriots and 11 from the Patriots to the Jets. Players are loyal to him because he's loyal to them. You may chafe at Parcells' grip on you. When all is said and done, you'll play hurt, you'll play valiantly, you'll play better than what you are. You will be basically a Green Beret for Bill Parcells. He called and said, I think I'm going to have a job by Friday. Do you want to go? I said, yeah. So I called my wife and I said, Bill's going to come back and coach. And she said, oh, where's that? I said, oh, I don't know. She said, you didn't even ask where we're going? I said, no. <laughs> I just wanted to work for him. Bill was a great football player, outstanding basketball player, and a tremendous baseball player. If he were coming out of school today, he would have signed a big bonus contract for baseball. The oldest of four children born to Ida and Charles Parcells, Bill was born on August 22, 1941. As a three-sport athlete at Riverdale High School in Oradell, New Jersey, he grew up in an atmosphere where there were no excuses, especially to his father. He told me one night, this was in basketball, he said, if you want to play like you played tonight, he said, you ought to just give the game up. Give it up because you really don't have any concept of what's going on. And that hurt me. Bill would fail at something, and then he would say, well, Dad, I tried my best. And his father would say, you know, get no medals for trying. Ask his players, ask anybody. He'll quote his father a million times. My father always said, complaint department's on the fourth floor. You know, that kind of stuff. If his father introduced him to the concept of teamwork, Parcells learned the importance of self-restraint from his high school basketball coach, Mickey Corcoran. I occasionally would mouth off to the officials. He put me in line on that. Several times, I had to throw him out of the gym for being overly demonstrative, kicking a basketball. He was sort of blown away by the autocratic way that Mickey did things. Parcells realized at an early age that authority has to be absolute. After a frustrating loss in his sophomore year, Parcells responded in a way that reminded his coach of a man he had played for years earlier at a school called St. Cecilia's, Vince Lombardi. I said, Bill, you did a great job. Terrific, you left it all out on the floor. Yeah, it was a moral victory. And at 15 years of age, he looked at me and said, Coach, there are no moral victories. You either win or you lose. And we lost. Kind of remarkable for a 15-year-old kid. Lombardi was tough and he was smart. Parcells the same way. If you look at how they ran their programs, the iron-fisted way, when necessary, totally tear a guy down and build him back up. Just like Lombardi won at Green Bay, Bill has won big games, championships, 
with players that aren't going to win someplace else under another coach. After a standout career as a linebacker at Wichita State, Parcells was selected by Detroit in the seventh round of the 1964 NFL Draft. Cut in training camp, he gave up hopes of playing in the pros and accepted an assistant coach's position at Hastings College in Nebraska. Nebraska Wesleyan was a team that was about as good as we were. They like to run this certain bootleg pass. I work on it in practice. We go over it quite a few times. They drive the ball down there pretty early in the game and they run this bootleg. I just bit off the fake. I went the wrong way. I was out of position and they scored and Bill was beside himself. Jack Giddings really was the first one that got the full blast of a Parcells chewing. He chewed on him and chewed on him and chewed on him. Finally, I said, Bill, that's our best player. He's had enough. Bill said, well, but coach, we worked. And I let about that much get out. He said, well, you didn't go over it enough because he didn't get it. That stopped me in my tracks. And that put it back on what coaching's about. I hadn't gone over it enough, or a player who was as dedicated as Jack Giddings would have executed it the right way. Parcells was an assistant at six schools in 14 seasons, finally landing a head coaching job at the Air Force Academy in 1978. Following a 3-8 and eight season, he took a job as the linebackers coach of the Giants. But under pressure from his family, Parcells quit after minicamp and returned to Colorado Springs. Well, let me tell you about my daughters. I feel sorry for them in some respects because they had to move eight or nine times and pick up as young girls and go to another school and adjust and acclimate to every single part of this country. It's just a question of priorities then. I had three daughters that were important and a wife, and I just had to do something. Unfortunately, it cost me a job that I really had waited for for a long time. But the cost of giving up football weighed heavily on Parcells in 1979, when he split his time selling real estate and directing the activities at a local country club. A year later, he was back in the game as the linebackers coach of the Patriots. The following season, he rejoined the Giants, this time as defensive coordinator. to go into a situation where he doesn't feel in complete control and doesn't have all the answers. Bill hated to fly. He's such a control freak that if he couldn't fly that plane, he had to put his life and his trust in somebody else. And I think that's what bothered him the most. This is something I've dealt with for all my life. And I've had a fear of flying since I was young. And I haven't been able to overcome it. But I go because it's a challenge to my ego. <laughs> Nothing could have been more of a challenge than being given the reins of the Giants in 1983. The rookie NFL head coach performed no miracles as New York won just three games. But beyond football, there was far greater loss. Both his parents died in a span of six weeks. It was a very tough year personally, but at the end of the day, nobody really cares what your problems are. Nobody cares why you're losing. Bill Parcells almost didn't get through his first year with the Giants. That's well documented. George Young was wondering if he was gonna do it and was starting to look for other people. I think that changed my whole mindset on my profession. And I know I forged a new determination because I can remember mentally saying, well, if they're gonna get rid of me, they're gonna get rid of me doing it my way. By opening day of 1984, Parcells had purged almost half the Giants roster from the previous year. He knew what he wanted his team to be, what he wanted it to look like, what he wanted it to act like, how he wanted it to play. Once they got into the playoffs in 84, players wanted to come to the Giants. They wanted to play for him because they could see that something good was going to happen there. There was no doubt in our minds that we were you know, going to the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl champions are the Giants. After leading the Giants to a second Super Bowl victory in January of 1991, Parcells retired because of health problems and underwent open-heart surgery. He spent the next two seasons as an NFL analyst for NBC. In 1993, he signed to coach New England, but after three seasons, Parcells found himself in a power struggle with owner Robert Kraft. 96, he wanted a strong defensive player. 
Bobby Greer, who was the, the personnel head, wanted uh, this game-breaking wide receiver from Ohio State by the name of Terry Glenn. Kraft felt he had to back Bobby Greer because Greer wanted a wide receiver. With the uh, seventh pick in the first round, the New England Patriots select Terry Glenn, wide receiver, Ohio State. He uttered the phrase, if you're going to cook the meal, you ought to be able to shop for the groceries. And that sums up the whole thing. Yes, it was about control. Despite the front office turmoil, Parcells led the Patriots to the Super Bowl, losing to the Packers 35-21. Five days later, he quit his job. Without total control, the obsessive coach often sought comfort in his lifelong belief in superstition. He's the most superstitious man I've ever met. He had to have things done his way, and superstition was a part of his way. The players could jerk his chain. If we were on a streak of some sort, Harry would go to Bill and say, hey, Bill, you know, we were out of practice 30 minutes early last week. Why are we still out here? He blow the whistle, everybody off. You know, just like that. He went to get some dental work done on a Tuesday, and they won that week. So he went back to the dentist the next Tuesday. All he did was walk in, sit down in the same chair that he was sitting in the past few Tuesday nights at the exact same time. He sat down for about 30 seconds, said goodbye to everybody, and walked out. When they made the uh, Super Bowl for the second time with the Giants, he tracked down the pilot of the plane from their first Super Bowl trip to the Rose Bowl in Pasadena in 1986. The pilot had already retired. So what Bill worked out is they would bring him back, he would be recertified, and he would fly them to the Super Bowl. You think, why is this future Hall of Fame coach doing little nonsense things like that? But it's all part of the mystique, the fabric of uh, who Parcells is. In the late 1960s, two fiery young coaches at West Point formed what would become a lifelong bond. Bill Parcells was in charge of the defensive line, Bob Knight of the basketball team. They scouted for each other, and they watched each other's back. We were playing Rutgers, and Bill went to the game with us. And we get beat at the buzzer. Bill is in the corner of the locker room, and he said, when we're walking off the floor, some guy leaned over the balcony and took a swipe at you with a program. He missed you, but he came down kind of over the balcony, and I just reached up and cold cocked him. He said, I knocked him back up in the seats, and I think the cops are looking for me. Parcell's dominant nature was never on fuller public display than during his bouts with the media. I don't want to talk about anything but this season. We'll talk about next season, next season, okay? He didn't have any time for people in the media that didn't know what they were doing. I could feel my anger at those guys as they would ask the question. You try to antagonize me? Oh, well, then what are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? He tries to be the bully, the press conference bully. Oh, give me a break with that dumbass question. That's a dumbass question. He will have no problem denigrating you in front of everybody. Explain to me the purpose of the question, if you have one. He was oftentimes testy, used the media more than any coach in NFL history. The more time he spends with us, the less time we're in there pestering one of his guys about why he dropped three balls last week. I'm not saying anything. You're saying he did say it. <laughs> well, you write for the paper. Is it credible? <laughs> to get the good stuff, he was willing to put up with the condescension and with the manipulation and with the intimidation because his best was the best I've ever known. Sometimes you have to get hit in the face with a skunk three or four times before you smell it. <laughs> As a reporter, he wanted you to challenge him. He would bark at you, and he wanted you to fight back. If you didn't fight back, he would bully you. Give me a break with that crap. Uh, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a jerk. You call that kid the next day and apologize to me. He, he, this big, rough, tough character who was very dominant at that press conference with that kid wanted to go out of his way to apologize. So he felt bad about it. In 1986, at least one fan felt the softer side of Parcells. Stephen McDonald of the NYPD was rendered a quadriplegic when he was shot in the line of duty. Parcells visited him in the hospital and maintained contact through the years. He came right over to, to greet me, and he was just a real good guy. 
I want to say, affectionate, um, concerned about my situation. Was I being taken care of? He's an inspiration to me, this guy. What happened to him and see how he's been able to make a life under very, very difficult circumstances. He's a guy I admire very much. For many who have played for him, the feeling of admiration was returned. Several days after stepping down as head coach of the Jets, Parcells discovered the 1999 Team MVP trophy given to Curtis Martin sitting on his desk. With a little note from Curtis Martin saying, Bill, I just wanted you to have this trophy. You've meant so much to my career. Love, boy, wonder. And Bill said he just sat down in his chair, started crying like a baby. I didn't grow up with my father in, in the home. And I never really had no one just look out for me and really be concerned about me. And when I look at Parcells, I know that he had a genuine concern about me. Pepper Johnson got hurt one time, and he was genuinely heartbroken about him not being able to play the rest of the year with us. He took the entire team, all 45 guys, and squeezed them into the trainer's room just to be around Pepper and make Pepper feel as if he were part of the team for the post-game speech. Sam Gash was in a hospital bed when they won the AFC Championship game, and Parcells accepts the trophy and says, this is for Sam Gash. In his final goodbye to the Jets players, Parcells read a poem that reflected his simple philosophy. When you get what you want in your struggle for self and the world makes you king for a day, just go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what the man has to say. For it isn't your parents, your children, or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. The fella whose verdict counts most in your life is the one staring back from the glass. After two years away from the game, Parcells' man staring back from the glass became restless. In 2003, he accepted the considerable challenge of resurrecting the remains of a vanquished dynasty in Dallas. He did it seemingly overnight, leading the Cowboys to a 10-6 record and their first berth in the playoffs in four years. It wasn't a talented team. It was a team that bought into his system and bought into exactly what he wanted out of the team. Parcells' troops went 24-24 and 24 over the next three seasons. After a first-round playoff loss in January of 2007, the 65-year-old coach hung it up again. Eleven months later, Big Tuna surfaced with the Dolphins as their executive vice president of football operations. Although he wouldn't be calling the shots on game day, his impact as a coach endures. Bill Parcells was a guy you hated for six days. And on, the, on Sunday when you won, he's the first guy you hug. Bill Parcells was a guy who didn't care if you loved him, didn't care if you respected him. He did it his way. And his way, more often than not, was the right way. I think he's made a difference that's far deeper than X's and O's. He's one of the great coaches of all time. And if I had two or three coaches I could play for, Parcells would have been one of them. During the 1980s, Bill Parcells became aware that some of his New York Giants had drug problems. The biggest name was Lawrence Taylor. So Parcells visited several treatment centers and spoke with counselors and psychiatrists. He wanted to know exactly the ordeal his players were enduring and how he could best help them to overcome their addictions. He may have snarled and driven them without mercy on the field, but off it, he was a man of sincerity and compassion. For sports